Mr. President, it's not been that long since the President's health care proposal uh, has been passed. If we recall, it was passed on Christmas Eve uh, after a long battle. Uh, we were told, well, don't worry what's in it. We'll have to pass it first to find out what's in it. I remember that Senator Brown was running in the state of Massachusetts, a liberal state. And he said, if you elect me, and he was running in a special election, I'll vote against it and provide the vote that kills it. Uh, and the matter was uh, delayed. His appointment and confirmation after he'd won his election was, was uh, put off. And the uh, interim senator cast the vote uh, for the bill, and it passed by a single vote, passed 60 to 40 uh, to move forward. I think it was a dangerous dangerous step for America. I'm ranking Republican on the Budget Committee and, and, and the Senator's uh, uh, ranking uh, on the, uh, as a member of that committee. And so we have um, serious concerns about what's in this bill. Now that we're beginning to read it, now that we're beginning to apply it and see what might happen. Uh, Senator Johnson is a successful businessman, uh, ran for the United States Senate and joined us just a, a little over a year ago, and he came here to do something. I've been exceedingly impressed with his approach to business. And he's looked at these numbers uh, and actually challenged the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, 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 Secretary Sebelius, uh, last week on some numbers, and the situation was quite troubling. Senator Johnson, maybe you could tell us about your concern, what you raised last week, uh, the economic impact of what's happening, jobs and on the American economy and the debt of our country. And maybe we can begin our discussion uh, springing off from where you're coming from and what you uh, observed from your exchange last week. Well, sure. Well, first of all, Senator Sessions, thank you for those, those kind comments. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi famously stated that we need to pass this bill in order to figure out what's in it. You know, what, what I know you and I are dedicated to, make sure that uh, the Obama administration doesn't make sure that this law is fully implemented before we understand the true cost of the bill. We simply can't afford not to have the American people, not to have members of Congress understand the true cost of the health care law. And, now, I would just remind everybody that back in 1965, when they passed the Medicare bill, first of all, the entire bill was less than 300 pages. I think that was kind of interesting. You know, the, the provision that applied to Medicare alone was about 124 pages. That compares, of course, to the 26 or 2700 page bill that uh, the uh, patient, or patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was. And now there have been over 10,000 pages of regulation just trying to implement this thing. But when they passed Medicare, they estimated out 25 years and said in 1990, Medicare would cost $12 billion. Well, in fact, in 1990, Medicare cost $110 billion, more than nine times the original cost estimate. And Senator Sessions, uh, I'm new here, but I've been watching this, this town pretty carefully over, over the last few decades. And I don't believe Washington has gotten any better at projecting and estimating figures, particularly not on, on new entitlements that, uh, that people want around here. Uh, they always tend to underestimate spending in order to be able to pass these things, particularly a, a bill like the health care law that was done so in such a partisan fashion without any really support or any kind of input from, from our side. So the point of my questions to Secretary Sebelius last week was just trying to lay out the broken promises that have already occurred as they just, before we even really begin or have only begun to begin to uh, implement this law. And of course, the first broken promise that I asked her about was the, the very famous uh, guarantee of President Obama that said that if you pass this health care law, every single family in America will see their insurance premium, their annual insurance premium, go down by $2,500 by the end of his first term, by the way. 
Now, the, the Kaiser Family Foundation has already conducted a study and said that on average, health care premiums per family have gone up about $2,200 per year. That's a $4,700 difference in just the first three years of this administration, or really only two years after it was originally passed. Well, Senator Johnson, you've been in the real world having to make a payroll and manage a company. Uh, if you as a CEO made a representation that this was going to reduce the, pay, the cost of insurance for your employees by uh, $2,000 and increase it to $2,400, uh, I mean, that would, that would be a stunning event, would it not? Does it bother you as a person from the real world, first time you've been in elected office, uh, to uh, have people walking around with numbers so divergent as promising to reduce health care costs and actually driving up health care costs? Well, let's put it this way. Had I made that guarantee to my management, to my shareholders, and that's basically what the president did. He's, he made that, that guarantee to the shareholders of America. You know, I wouldn't want to have to face the budget committee or the, the budget meeting when I had to explain away that, that broken promise. And that's, of course, what you know, Secretary Sebelius was in a very unenviable position of trying to explain how the President guaranteed a $2,500 reduction in the cost when, in fact, we've seen a $2,200 increase in those insurance premiums. Well, you are right. I was here. It was a promise made to achieve the passage of the bill. And a lot of Americans didn't believe these promises thought they were inflated to begin with, and this promise, a fundamental promise, has already been proven to be wildly inaccurate, uh, and, and thank you for raising it. And of course, that's only the first promise. I have a couple more. The administration also famously said that this, thing, this health care law would now add one dime to the deficit. In fact, the original projections were that it would save $143 billion in the first 10 years. Well, thankfully, the administration has recognized that the Class Act was, as you know, Budget Committee Chairman Ken Conrad said, is a Ponzi scheme. It simply was not financially workable. So they're not implementing it. Well, because they're not implementing it, they're not going to get $86 billion worth of revenue. So that's going to eat away at that $143 billion of deficit reduction. And then, of course, last uh, the couple weeks ago when President uh, Obama uh, presented his fiscal year 2013 budget, included in that budget was, was a $111 billion request, or I guess cost estimate, on the mandatory spending of the health care exchanges. But if you add the $111 billion to the $86 billion, that gives you $197 billion of reduced deficit reduction, if that makes sense. So bottom line here is, I think that's broken promise number two. I do not believe in the first 10 years that this thing is actually going to reduce the deficit. And it's in Senator Sessions, it's far worse than that. This, this, these are the small numbers. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the revisions that are going to be occurring when we actually start finding out what the true cost of the health care law is. Well, the pr promise was, that, and it was repeated here, and the president went on national TV, I believe he said it, at the State of the Union. It, this bill will not add one dime to the deficit if you drop out the 80 or so billion dollars and he estimated that his plan if passed would actually create 143 billion dollars in surplus in extra revenue for the treasury it wouldn't cost anything it would create more money and so you lose 80 or so billion uh because the class act is proven to be the Ponzi scheme Senator Conrad said it would be. And we just saw in the President's budget a request for $111 billion more for the uh, uh, exchanges. Well, that already wipes out entirely, does it not? The promise that it wouldn't add to the deficit before the bill's even implemented, really. The projections are that it would, it would cost money rather than make money for the Treasury? Is, right. is that, that your analysis so far? Exactly. That's broken promise number two. And of course, broken promise number three is also very famously, this President said, if you like your health care plan, you will be able to keep your health care plan, period. No one will take it away no matter what. Now, th there's a couple pieces of evidence that prove that that also is a broken promise. 
First of all, the CBO, in its initial cost estimate of the health care law, estimated that a million people would lose their employer-sponsored care and be put in the exchanges. So right away, that, by the way, that's a gross underestimate, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But also just the fact that uh, the Department of HHS has granted 12 to 1,700 waivers from basically some of the requirements of the health care law also indicate that it were it not for those waivers. Basically, employers are saying, listen, we, we, we need some relief here. Were it not for those waivers, you know, my concern would be, and I think this is probably pretty true, is that those employers would probably be forced to drop coverage. And that those waivers cover about 4 million Americans. But l l let, me, let me describe a little bit why I believe the million person estimate is so understated. Uh, there have been surveys of employers conducted now in the last year that prove or that indicate that employers, when they take a look at the whole cost equation of, of the health care law, 30 to 50 percent in one survey conducted by McKinsey and Company of employers when asked plan on dropping their health care coverage shortly after implementation. Now, Senator Sessions, if that were to happen, 180 million Americans get their care through an employer-sponsored plan. If 50 percent drop coverage, that could mean 90 million Americans, not a million, 90 million Americans could lose their employer-sponsored care and then get put in the exchanges. And we're trying to get, work with the CBO to find out exactly what that would cost. But in their initial estimate, they thought they estimated it would be $7,000 average sub subsidy per person in the exchange. Now, if you deduct for the, the $2,000 penalty and the deductibility of the health care costs, that subsidy could range anywhere from four dollars to $5,000 cost to the government times 90 million people. Instead of $95 billion a year, Senator Sessions, the health care law could cost us close to a half a trillion if 50% of the employers drop their coverage. Now, that, this is incredibly scary. I mean, and you're fully aware. You've been a real leader in terms of our debt and deficit issue, how, like Admiral Mullen said, it's the greatest single threat to our security is our national debt and deficit. We can't afford increasing our deficit on an annual basis, close to half a trillion dollars. If everybody were to lose co the coverage, which, by the way, is exactly what I think this plan was designed to do, lead to a single-payer system, which is what President Obama really, I believe, wanted, that would cost us close to a trillion dollars a year. I mean, that represents a deficit risk that will just absolutely ensure the final bankruptcy of this nation. Well, Senator Johnson, you have been talking about this issue for some time, and it looks like reports are coming along to validate it, validate your concerns. But the administration estimated only one million would go into the exchanges. And these are the areas where if you don't have employer-based health care, care, the government will subsidize your health care program for you. And it costs the Treasury money. This is how we get in financial trouble when we make bad estimates. You think that the numbers that go into the exchanges could dwarf $1 million. How many could, be, could it be based on the reports that you've seen? Well, I, I worked with former CBO Director Douglas holtz -Aiken trying to look at the, at the numbers that are presented. We don't have enough. We don't have enough information, which is why I'm, I'm very grateful to the fact that Director Elmendorf uh, recognized the fact that there's some credible evidence to cause the CBO to reassess that estimate of a million people. So they're, they're working through those numbers right now. Hopefully they'll give us a very full accounting of that in the next couple of weeks. But th the work I did with uh, Douglas holtz aiken showed that if 50 percent, if 90 million people get put in those exchanges, it could cost over $400 billion a year. That's astounding. It is astounding. Um, for example, uh, $400 billion a year over a 10-year window would be $4 trillion. And the Budget Control Act that we worked on so hard last summer that the President's already undermining, but if it were to take place, would only reduce spending over 10 years $2 trillion. And this would be an unexpected $5 trillion, $4 trillion added on top of that, would it not? Exactly. And that's, it's that's not baked into the numbers now. We're not assuming it's going to be 4 or $5 trillion more health care cost on Obamacare. We're assuming only one, uh, one I guess. And, and I'm, unfortunately, we're not, we're not even owning up to the current deficit projections. 
And we're not seriously addressing that. So nobody really wants to take a look at the danger inherent in this. And of course, the administration doesn't want to talk about it or admit to it because they want to go full speed ahead and make sure that, that the health care law gets fully implemented so that we'll, we will not be able to reverse it. And that, that's the main point here. This, it is time to put the brakes on the implementation of the health care law before it bankrupts this nation. We, we simply can't afford to fully implement it to find out what the true cost is. It would be disastrous for our, our deficit and, and debt. Well, Senator Johnson, is it too late? Um, is this a fait accompli, this health care law that was passed? Uh, can we not reverse it? Or is it, in your opinion, practical uh, at this point for us to uh, pull back? from it's, this uh, path. It's essential that we pull back. It's essential that we put the brakes on this. And I guess we can all keep our fingers crossed and hope the Supreme Court rules the, the individual mandate unconstitutional and that there is no severability clause so the entire law is repealed so that then we can actually fix the problems in the health care system with patient-centered, free market-based reforms. That's the way to really address this. Well. You raised these issues with uh, Secretary Sebelius um, last week in the committee, and the thing is, you, the exchange has been on the TV and on the web, and it's become a bit of a sensation, really. People have been uh, looking at it, and it's been very troubling. Would you uh, tell us what troubled you about uh, Secretary Sebelius' answers or, his, or lack of them, and uh, uh, what do you think we should do next? Well, again, if, if, if I'm an accountant. I've, I've been in hundreds of budget meetings. And you know, when, when you're presenting your budget to the budget committee, you're armed with the information. You're ready to answer questions. And I was, I was surprised that the secretary was unable to answer the questions. And really, particularly when I, I, I mentioned the waivers, she seemed to have no idea what I was talking about. Now, it's her agency. It's her department that is actually granting those waivers. So uh, that troubles me. So you know, I appreciate the fact that uh, you've offered, and, and we've, we've sent a letter to uh, uh, Budget Chairman Conrad requesting, and to be fair to Secretary Sebelius, to give her a chance to be fully prepared to come before us and explain you know, what is this $111 billion in additional requested funds for the exchanges. And really, I'd like to really dig down and, and really talk about this million person estimate and what is going to be the effect if, if the administration's wrong, if CBO has been wrong in the previous estimate and, and the McKenzie study is right and half the people very quickly after implementation get dropped from their employer coverage and get put in the exchanges. What is the effect of that going to be on our, on our budget? You know, I'd, I'd love to give, uh, I, th and I think it's appropriate to give uh, Secretary Sebius the opportunity to come before our, our budget committee and, and have a, a, a fair exchange in terms of explaining those, those uh, parts of her budget. Well, a hundred eleven billion dollar era is a big deal. If you think about it, we brought in two thousand two hundred billion, twenty two hundred billion. This is one hundred billion, about five percent of the entire estimated revenue that we had in the government last year. Uh, to miss that on one part of one bill is very troubling to me. We're fighting every day, wrestling with a highway bill. We came up $2 billion short over two years. And when the whole bill is held up and votes on it, points of order raised about it. And here, blithely, into the president's budget comes another $111 billion. Um, I'm sure that... Uh, there can be some explanation for it. But I really do think the American people, don't you, are owed a prepared secretary before the budget committee that could lay out explanation for what this is so we'll know how much over cost we are already are on this well, plan. You know, it's, it's, you know, 100 billion here, 100 billion there, you know, it starts adding up to real money, doesn't it? And you know, one thing I'd like to point out too is so that people don't think that this 90, million people getting dropped from their employer coverage is a fantasy. It's not. It's very realistic. Let, let me explain that. I, I bought health care for the last 31 years. And the decision employers are going to make is going to be actually quite easy. It's not going to be a complex financial decision. Employers are going to be faced, because of the, the health care law, they can say, okay, I can pay $15,000 for family coverage, or I can pay the $2,000 penalty. And because of the health care law's subsidies, you're not exposing your employees to financial risk. 
you're making them eligible for huge subsidies. If, if a household earns $64,000, they'll be eligible for a $10,000 subsidy through those exchanges. Now, I know that probably sounds pretty good, but the problem is when, we've already, when we're already running $1.3 trillion year deficits, we can't afford to add another half a trillion dollars per year to those deficits if that were to happen. We simply can't afford it. So your employer, you've got employees, uh, and you've been helping them you've been providing health coverage, and you realize I can cancel my, my employer contributions, let the employee go to the exchanges, and they'll be subsidized by the American taxpayer. And Senator, Senator Sessions, subs where's the money coming from that will provide the extra money they'll need to get uh, full coverage? And if you don't drop coverage, you're denying the people that work with you the chance of taking advantage of a $10,000 subsidy. I mean, we have created an incentive in this health care law for employers to drop coverage and for the people that work with them to get their coverage through the exchanges at high, at high levels of subsidy. We've created that incentive. And when, when government creates incentive, when government dangles a huge subsidy in front of people, the hist we know what happens. We know the history of that. People take advantage of those subsidies, and that's my concern. What about a new business, uh, some small business that starts up and they're thinking about whether or not that they're going to provide health care uh, for their employees and they have the option of the uh, exchanges. Do you think a new business would be even more likely to uh, uh, not provide coverage and, and let the employee uh, go to the subsidized exchange? Sure, because they know, they know their cost is going to be $2,000 per employee. But you, know, you were telling me a story earlier about uh, some employers in Alabama that, that simply, you know, because it's a low margin business, uh, they simply can't afford to offer health care. And the result of the health care law, I mean, why don't you tell the story? Well, I had a number of uh, people in a meeting I was at to explain the re realities of it. And uh, they told us that they were, the whole, fear of regulation and the health care bill and the revenue that's going to be extracted from them to pay for it uh, would result in lesser employees and uh, uh, making it impossible for them to provide the coverage. Um, so one, one told me that they could lose as, as many as 70 employees. I remember that figure. Yeah. So, so again, this, is, this, is, this law will cost jobs. It's going to blow a hole in our deficit, and we haven't even talked about the quality aspect, how it's going to harm our health care system, you know, how, it, how it will lead to rationing, how the type of medical innovation, you've heard the story about my daughter, you know, these marvelous sur surgeons that when my daughter was first born with a serious congenital heart defect, you know, one of these wonderful human beings came in at 1.30 in the morning, saved her life, and then eight months later, when her heart was the size of a plum, they reconstructed the upper chamber of her heart. So now our heart operates backwards, okay? We are going to, those types of innovations that saved my daughter's life, we're going to limit that innovation. We're not going to have that type of, of uh, advancement in medicine if the government takes over control of our health care system. So that's, the budget is, the, the effect on our budget, the uncertainty in terms of how it's going to destroy, you know, explode our deficits, you know, versus how the harm it's going to cause our the quality of care, lead to rationing, lower innovation. I mean, when, it, when it's all put together, I think the greatest single priority we have to have moving forward here is we have to make sure that this health care law, is, that the brakes are put on it, that it, it is repealed, and re, again, replaced with patient-centered, free market-based reforms. Well, it's not fully in, 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 uh, implemented yet. There's a lot of opportunities for us to get off this train before uh, a disaster occurs. I truly believe it. It's just not too late uh, for us to alter the course. And I think the American people uh, have never been happy with it. Uh, they've been told that it, they wouldn't have to uh, give up their health care. They were told it was going to bring down the cost curve and reduce the cost. And they were told it was going to create pay for itself. It would be uh, more money coming in than a bill would cost. Uh, would you say all three of those promises have now already been proven false? Absolutely. And look at the name of it. The Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. I mean, it's not going to protect patients. 
If we're going to lower the quality of care, if, we're going to, if it's going to result in rationing, if it limits innovation, how does that protect patients? And Affordable Care Act, I mean, you just, you just tick, ticked off the three reasons that it's not going to be affordable. It's going to drive up costs. It's not bending the cost curve down. It's just, it's a fiction. I mean, the, the health care law is a fiction, and, it's, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of your efforts at, again, making sure that before this thing is fully implemented, you know, we both are dedicated to make sure the American people fully understand the full, true cost of this health care law, both on quality and the effect on our budget. Well, I'll just add one more thought to the cost. And I've looked at this very carefully. December 23rd, the night before the bill passed, I got a letter back from the director of the Congressional Budget Office who also had stated it would create a surplus in the bill of $143 billion based on conventional accounting procedures. And I asked him, what, did, were they not double counting the money? about $400 billion. Were they not double counting it, counting it as income to Medicare and counting it as money available to fund the uh, uh, patient's bill here, the President's Obama's uh, Obamacare? Weren't they using the money twice? Think about that. Here we are on the eve of a vote, December 23rd. The vote's tomorrow morning, December 24th. And we're not agreed on whether the money is being double counted. And he wrote back and said it's being double counted. Quote, although the conventions of accounting might suggest otherwise. Close quote. The way they scored this bill was carefully done by experts to get the score that they got that it would make a surplus of $140 billion. But the money was Medicare money. They raised taxes from Medicare. They cut costs from Medicare. It created some money on Medicare. But the money was borrowed by the U.S. Treasury and spent on this new program. The money is owed to the Medicare trustees, who are trustees by law. They're holding debt instruments from the United States, but because it's an internal debt, it doesn't score. Now, that may be complicated, but it's not. Trust me, they borrowed this money. And sooner or later, when Medicare is going into deep financial distress, is going to call their bonds from the Treasury, and the Treasury is going to have to pay it, and they're going to borrow the money on the open market. What they're going to do so they can pay the Medicare trustees the money they borrowed from them. This is not a good way to do business. And so that's just one of the additional problems we've got with this. But Senator Johnson, thank you. Thank you for focusing on all of these issues, but particularly for raising the uh, at cost of the exchanges, because that, by any estimate, wouldn't you agree, is a dangerous number. It could surge above the number we're at. I think, don't you think most any person, even if they thought it would be a million dollars, a million people, would have to admit it could be five, 10, or 20 million people? Nobody knows for sure. Exactly, and that, that's, that's why I'm so thankful that uh, CBO Director Almendorf understands that there really is some pretty credible evidence to have the CBO revisit that estimate. Uh, I spoke with them last week. It looks like they're, they're uh, working hard to provide us that information. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that and see what their estimate, their revised estimate is for the number of people losing their coverage, but even more importantly, to figure out what that per person cost is. I mean, may, maybe we won't agree. I mean, he might do a very economic analysis, and certainly somebody like myself who actually bought health care understands the mindset, you know, the decision of an employer. But even if we disagree in the number of people, if we have that, that total dollar amount cost per person in that exchange, we'll be able to show that to the American people. So if, if he comes up with X and I say, no, it's really X plus, you know, 30, 40, 50 million people, then at least the American people have that information and they can judge for themselves what they think the realistic estimate is for people losing their coverage and getting their insurance through the subsidized exchanges. That's in information is what the American people deserve, and that's why I'm so appreciative of your efforts, and I know you're going to be just with me, making sure that, again, we know what the true cost of this health care law is before we implement it. Well, we've got to know that. 
We have a responsibility as representatives of the people to understand, are we talking about another $100 billion in cost over just one year's time that we weren't expecting? And I believe that uh, the Budget Committee is a good forum to have that. I know you and I serve on that committee and I hope that Senator Conrad uh, can agree and would agree to give Secretary Sebelius an opportunity to uh, state uh, her view of the situation. Uh, I just have to say, I'm more and more convinced that we cannot afford this health care bill. We cannot afford it. We just don't have the money. We just don't have the money. I think it will damage health care. So we've had a lot of debate. Experts test us that, that, that and reduce the quality of care in America. But what I'm saying to you is we can't afford it. And it threatens the financial viability of our future. We need to save Medicare and Social Security, the programs we've got. It would be a terrible tragedy if we start off on another program, like you talked about Medicare 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It surged way beyond any estimate they would ever expect uh, in terms of cost. If we start on another program, uh, I don't see how this country can sustain it. The entitlements that we have today are now taking up about 60% of the entire budget of America, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Over 50 percent, almost 60 uh, percent of our entire spending goes for those three programs. To start another massive new program when those are all unsound financially and in cri crisis and need to be fixed is the height of uh, foolishness in my opinion. And I hope we can have a good hearing. Thank you for your leadership and uh, great addition to the Budget Committee. And really thank you for spending hours uh, digging into these numbers, bringing your business and accounting skills to bear, and let us lawyer bunch uh, benefits from somebody that can actually add and subtract, I gotta tell you. So, thank you, thank you for your leadership. Mr. President, I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum.